Good morning, I'm Karen, and I'm doing the scripture reading this morning, which is from the book of Acts, chapter 3, verses 1 to 16. And I'm reading from the NIV version. So starting at verse 1. One day Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer, at 3 in the afternoon. Now a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him, as did John. Then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave him his attention, expecting to get something from them. Then Peter said, silver or gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and, an feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. When all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. While the man held on to Peter and John, all the people were astonished and came running to them in the place called Solomon's Colonnade. When Peter saw this, he said to them, Fellow Israelites, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us as if by our own power or godliness we had made this man walk? The God of Abraham, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus. You handed him over to be killed, and you disowned him before Pilate, though he had decided to let him go. You disowned the Holy and Righteous One and asked that a murderer be released to you. You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. We are witnesses of this. By faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see and know was made strong. It is Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that has completely healed him, as you can all see. The word of the Lord. Good morning, everyone. Great to see you. If you've not been back since New Year, then Happy New Year to you. It's, uh, it's been cold, right? Did anyone else notice we were just like reminding ourselves of how cold it was by some of the graphics Donna chose, like behind the songs, like icicles and like snowflakes. It's like, oh, come on. <laughs> I think it's cold, and then where we used to live in Calgary, friends keep, you know, there's a, there's a point where people living in cold climates start, like, putting the temperature on social media. It's been happening a lot this week. That's my social media feeds, is all my friends is going, it's so cold, and it is, but it's cold for us, too. Um, I want to welcome everyone here uh, at the 1045 service. I want to welcome everyone online as you're joining, maybe watching now or later. Uh, just a quick couple of things. You'll notice that we've made a few more adjustments um, in the cheap seats way at the back there. Um, <clears throat> and so just last week, we had a, an incident where someone couldn't get through with a wheelchair because of the numbers of seats. Um, we had to put more seats out. We had to tear down the dividers and put more chairs out. Um, I just, whilst very well intentioned to throw more chairs in, in, in certain places, uh, we do have a legal... Uh, and, Important responsibility to keep our fire exits clear. So if you don't think a wheelchair can get through where you're currently throwing a chair, um, we're going to now implement a team to then stop you doing that so that said folks who are uh, in walkers and wheelchairs um, need, need good access through. So this area at the back now is, um, we just ask that you don't mess with the chairs, um, if that's okay. Um, and to you, as a 1045 service, it's very exciting that we're filling up. Um, we're roughly where we were in this service when all the kids were here, the last few services. We're roughly where we were in September numerically with one service. So when you think of this service and as it fills up, I just really want to invite you to consider 9 a.m. <laughs> 9 a.m. is a beautiful time of morning. You get up and the birds are singing louder than they are at 1045. The congregation sings stronger at 9 o'clock in the morning. The band are a little bit better because they're not bored of the songs yet at 9 a.m. Um, so just if you want to, just, just if you are able, and you might think of attending the 9 a.m. 
I know we run kids and youth at this service, but the services are currently identical. And if you would think of the 9 a.m. service, uh, they're, they're a really nice bunch. I told them this morning, I said, you might find some people are going to be joining you. So just get, you know, get, put your smiling faces on for people. So, and it's only been like three months. So it's not like they're strangers, right? But um, we have been through December in an Advent season. And then we had our wonderful Christmas Eve services. Um, I just want to say thank you to all of you who brought someone and maybe mentioned to someone. Um, we talked about Christmas Eve and we said, it's intentionally a service where people can come and you don't need to worry about it being weird. Um, we're gonna make it really ex- explain stuff and make it like a, an easy place to be for people who don't do church. And especially in the four o'clock service, somewhere between a half and two thirds were, were visitors, either out of town, but more people were just folk who just don't really do church very much. And so I just, I just want to encourage us that that was amazing that so many people came and that you made them feel welcome. And although we broke fire code at the four o'clock service, um, it was just amazing to see you being a church welcoming so many folk who are not part of this church. So I just, I was encouraged and I think you should be encouraged too. Um, and then last week, uh, well, then we had New Year's Day service, which was lovely, a New Year's Eve service, sorry, it was New Year's Eve, a very relaxed, cheering service. And then last week, Fee brought us back into Acts, into the series that we're in. Um, and she did so by looking at the end of chapter two and looking at a passage that the Bible, Scripture normally labels the fellowship of all believers. Um, I would really encourage you to listen to that on our YouTube channel. Um, you can just go onto our website and you'll see how to get there. But it's a great talk, thinking about us as a community of faith and what God's calling us to. Um, but before we move on, I just want to remind us, this is a, actually, this is a, this is a bigger Bible than I used to have. It's not because there's more in it. It's because the words are bigger. Because <laughs> I, I don't know if you noticed, I'd kind of be like, let's just look at verse... And I had to do that a little bit. So this is my new, improved, bigger text Bible because no laughing. So, (laughs) but we we look at why choose Acts? Out of all that we could look at, why Acts? Um, Well, it's something for us as a church now. It's kind of the blueprint. It's It's a snapshot. It's a reference point for when the early church, the first church, um, when they kind of set their path of what it meant to be the church, um, we are able to kind of reference back and look. And rather than lay over and say, are we doing everything exactly the same? Rather, we can reference the heart and the spirit of what's happening. And we can say, what does this mean for us today as it pertains to our church community? So Luke Acts, Luke Acts, as I said, is one book. There's flip forward, flip back a couple of chapters. And you see a book called Luke. It's written by Luke. Then Luke also wrote Acts. It's one book. And this is one of the things we said. Luke was this doctor guy. He was clearly very intent on making sure everything was put down in order, everything made sense. And his one piece of this Luke Acts book, it's really, it's really clever. Like Luke is all about Jesus when he was here on earth. And then it kind of finishes with his resurrection. And then Acts, like the second part, is starting with the resurrection and then everything that happens beyond that into the church that we know today. So it's like, so the, the big theme is continuation. It's not like it stops and then it restarts. It's like it's one piece. Jesus was active then and he's active today. So we want to remember to our, for, for ourselves by looking at Acts that our church and our lives in Christ are a continuation of what Jesus came, what he gave us, the life that he gave us, this is a very much a continuation as a joined up thing. Um, but it's worth asking, why did we spend <clears throat> so many weeks on two chapters? It's because these two chapters are full of such important information about the moment that this first church was breathed and birthed into life. If, if we miss these two chapters, we miss so much about the nature and the culture of this church. We, we've spent weeks on it because you know what? It's so easy to focus on the action and the doing and the moving forward and the activity 
And what can happen is we can fall into a trap where we all just get really busy on doing and seeing things grow and seeing things start. And in our own lives, we can be about what am I going to be about? What am I going to do? But what we can miss is in Acts 1 and 2, before it gets into all the doing, all the action, all the great stuff, it kind of focuses in really clearly and patiently and slowly um, to be focused on the one who breathes life into everything that then happened in Acts 3 further on. So we didn't skip 1 and 2 because 1 and 2 is kind of like, it's the, it's the propulsion. It's when the Holy Spirit came. It's when the church formed. It's when they kind of put some things in place that made Acts 3 to 28 possible. And if you're really good at math, and we've just talked about doing two chapters and there's 28 chapters in, in Acts, you're now going, there's 26 left? How long is this going to take? Well, we're going to be moving faster, don't worry. We're going to be moving faster through Acts. And here's the kind of real quick sketch. Um, we're going to, if, if the first part of Acts 1 and 2 was kind of talking about the birthing of a church, this middle section is kind of about the people, the plots, and the places of Acts. And then if you fast forward, um, well, how long is this going to take? Well, we think it's going to take until the end of the summer. And roughly the end of the summer, if you kind of flick forward, you, you realize all of a sudden Acts begins to like focus in on a guy called Paul. Paul writes a lot of this part of the Bible, the New Testament, but also Paul is kind of one of the main figures of the early church and as it expanded all around the world. So we're going to, over the summer, the plan is currently to then sit with Paul, get to know him a bit, get to know all of the different places he went and when he was there, what did he do and what did that mean for us and all that kind of stuff. So that's kind of the blueprint. Who is going to be speaking is one more thing that the leadership team have asked me to share with you. So when I first applied to the church, um, it said in the little thing, you've got to preach 75%. That's like three out of four Sundays. And I'm like, nope, thank you, if possible. <laughs> and I was like, could I do less? Because I love doing other things. It takes a lot of time to prepare to, to preach. And I said, I'd, I would love, I'd love to do other things. So could I come down to like 65% and then have others kind of around me and form a team? So we have a different iterations of a preaching team. And then just recently, I've gone to the leadership team and saying, there's a lot of people and there's a lot happening and there's a lot of momentum. And it feels like my time um, could maybe be better spread, not just doing 65% of the teaching, but maybe doing like 50% of the teaching. And then we have a new formed preaching team that then covers, um, and then we work together. We, we plan together, prep together, feedback together. Um, so that's what we're doing. It, this is not something that the leadership team have told me to do. This is something I've requested. I'm very excited about it. We have some amazingly gifted people in this church who can speak and share. And there's like a, there's the breadth to it. But for consistency, um, we've asked Ben Coles, Shirley Vargas, Caleb Gray, and Fee Murray um, to kind of form the five of us into this preaching team where we'll be kind of walking through together at and then whatever season, we, whatever we do in the fall. So just so you know, that's where we're going. That's what's happening. That's Acts. Um, and we're going to pause and pray before we jump into Acts 3, 1 to 16. So why don't you pray with me? God, it's great that we get to come together. And we get to come into your, your text, your, your word, the scripture. And God, our, our prayer today is that it isn't just words on a page, but rather it is something meaningful and powerful and impactful to our lives. So God, we pray today that above anything else that we hear you. We hear you speaking into our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. So our text tells of an account, an everyday account, Acts 3, 1 to 16, it tells of an everyday occurrence um, when there's a couple of guys, Peter and John, who were disciples of Jesus, and um, they're entering the temple courts, um, basically going to church. They're in the temple courts. It's the tradition that the first Christians kept was that they kept going to the temple um, because Jesus did that. That was part of the early um, Christian culture is that they would go to the temple courts for gathered worship, and then they would come into their homes for kind of scattered worship. And so this is an everyday occurrence. They're going to the temple. It's like you and I coming to church this morning. 
And, and the scripture tells us that they're walking in a place called Solomon's Portico. And it's this big porch, this huge covered area in the temple. Um, it doesn't matter, but it's on the east side of the temple outer courts. If you know the temple really well, that might mean something to you. Um, but this is a very big, expansive area. And John te- John's gospel, which is like a book in the New Testament, it tells us that Jesus himself had actually taught in this very spot. And then elsewhere, it tells us that this is a familiar place for the Christians of this time. So it's kind of like this is a really familiar space for these first Christians. Jesus had been there, taught them, and here they are again at Solomon's portico, um, and it's familiar to them. It's as familiar as you coming into this building if you, if you come here. And you're like, oh yeah, I know this space, I know the front door, I know how to get into the sanctuary. This all makes sense. And on their way, they come across a really familiar sight. There is a man who's been crippled from birth sitting, asking for money. Um, in a different, different translation of the Bible, it says he's asking for, for alms. And that's kind of charity that within the Jewish custom and law, there's permission for people to sit exactly where he's sitting, asking for money, and the idea is that those going back and forth from worship can, can give money to him um, so that he's taken care of. He's likely been there for years, maybe decades in that same spot, in the same posture, carried there by others, put down, setting him in his usual position, slumped low, not making eye contact, just an air of hopelessness surrounding him. And he sees Peter and John about to enter, and he kind of clocks them, and without looking at them, he asks the question he's probably asked thousands of times. Can I, can I have some money? And as I've mentioned, in this portion of Acts that we're going to be sitting with for a number of months here, places, plots, and people, well, we're introduced to this interesting plot twist. This amazing plot shift where an everyday moment where, I mean, they, they, they knew this guy. He sat there. They walked by him. Jesus probably walked by him. And all of a sudden, this plot shift where the kingdom of God breaks into his life and this everyday situation is transformed by the presence of two Jesus followers, two very normal people who follow Jesus. And there was a plot twist. Peter and John. They look at the guy. He's not looking at them, but they look directly at him and engage him on a personal level. It's not something that the typical worshipers to the temple are going to do. You see, within the Jewish rule and custom, there's a sense of piety tied in there. The idea is you can give to the poor, but you would never stop to talk to them because on your way to worship, that interaction would make you somewhat unclean. And so if you imagine in the picture, it's basically like chink and walk on. Right? It's not pause. It's not stop, look at me. There's a sense of, do you all see? You know, Jesus talks about this, like when people give loudly with all the socks, you know, a bit of a fanfare. It's kind of this image of that people are just dropping money in. But Peter and John stop. And what was unexpected for this cultural moment, for Peter and John to stop and have a conversation, that was unexpected in the cultural moment. For them personally, It was extremely expected. It was absolutely expected. Why? Because there's a deep sense of continuity that this is exactly what Jesus would have done. In fact, this is what they would have seen Jesus do. So Peter Peter and John were kind of like, oh yeah, we, this is what we do, right? We pause and talk to people. Whilst many would have met this man's physical need, like giving money, they stop and they address his spiritual need. The theologian Howard Marshall says this, what could, have, what could have simply been the occasion of mechanical charity is turned into a personal account, encounter as the lame man and the apostles, it's another word for Jesus' disciples, as they look intently at one another. I just wonder, it's kind of the question in my mind is like, why then? They've walked by this guy before. Jesus himself walked by this guy. What was going on in the moment where it wasn't just a mechanical charity in the box, but there was something of a personal encounter? And I just think they sensed God in that moment. 
nudging them, opening their eyes to see this man anew. And I've got two points today that I want to focus on this little interaction. This is a story about healing. The tail part of this, this text has a, a, a mini sermon. And I'm not saying they're not important, but there's lots of other places in Acts where we're going to see healings, miraculous. We're going to talk about that. Lots of other places where, where there's lots of great sermons and where we can dig into those. But for today, what I want to look at is uh, these two points. As Jesus followers... We need to call people to pay attention to the spiritual reality of God's kingdom and its transformational power. And then secondly, as Jesus followers, we need to direct people's affection to the one who does the work of transformation. So it's about attention and affection. We need to call people's attention to the reality that God is here. He's up to stuff. Don't miss it. And then when we have involvement and participation in highlighting the kingdom of God, when great stuff happens, to draw that affection to him and not to take it for ourselves. That's where we're going today. So firstly, as Jesus followers, we need to call people to pay attention to the spiritual reality of God's kingdom and its transformational power. And this is what the text says. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. And then Peter looked straight at him, as did John. And then they're not exactly sure why it mentions as did John, like a little side, side. There's like three or four thoughts on that. The most likely one is when Jesus sends people out in twos, and this is just re- like referencing, this is team ministry we do. It's not Peter all by himself with a sidekick. This is like the two of them going together. That's why it says as did John. Then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave them his attention expecting to get something from them. Money, right? Then Peter said, silver or gold I do not have, but what I do have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Before moving to the island, Fee and I were involved in leading Alpha in our last church. Um, In my group, there was a young guy, mid-twenties. He was a paramedic. And in the first couple of weeks when we talked about who's Jesus, what did Jesus do, why did Jesus die, um, this guy had been sitting quietly and then he, he shared something with me and he said this. He said, you know what, Craig? In my life, no one has ever raised the subject of Christianity or Jesus with me. No one's ever tried to persuade me for faith in Jesus. No one has ever tried to persuade me against faith in Jesus. And he said this, it's like I've, you know, I think, it, 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 I guess I just must have been left alone. Now, as Alpha progressed, he found an amazing connection with another guy in his group who was a believer, but had come through this whole kind of searching journey over the last number of years. And, and I, just, I just loved listening to them having these conversations. There's about three or four in my group who weren't Christians. Um, and at the end of this process of Alpha, um, he, he, he said to us, he said, you know, whilst I probably really honestly couldn't myself call, call myself a Christian, He said this, I have no doubt that Jesus is who he says he is. It's just going to take me a little bit of time to figure out what I do with that. He was on Alpha, actually, because his girlfriend was a Christian and had said to him, if you want to date me, you've got to know what I believe. Now, I don't promote that for a strategy for evangelism, right? Like, was it flirt to convert? So that's that's what they say. But um, however, here's the thing. No matter what situation you're in, Maybe it's your boyfriend, girlfriend who isn't saved. Whatever the situation is like this. Um, We have to call people to attention to the spiritual reality of God's kingdom and its transformational power. And that can sometimes feel really like, it can feel like a rub. Because you try to bring it up and you feel like you get smacked in the head and shut down. And you're like, oh, I'm trying to be really sensitive. I'm not trying to be aggressive. I'm trying to be gentle and I'm trying to be open. And we're going to talk a bit about this as to, why Peter and John seemed to have success in this moment. What, what was happening there? Um, you see, I think for Peter and John, they've walked by this guy before. As I've said, Jesus probably walked by this guy before. They'd, he'd, he'd, been, he'd been placed in the same place for years and years. And this was, the, this was like the stomping ground of the Christians. So why, why then? Why did Peter and John in that moment pay attention and for this young guy in my alpha group, 
why then? Why when he's like 25 years old? Why not when he's 21? Why not when he's five years old? I found it really helpful over the years to look at another part of the New Testament when Jesus sends out his disciples and he says to them, go out and then give your peace to the people that you're wanting to stay with and minister to. And if your peace is returned to you, then stay there, hang out with them, get to know them, build a relationship. If it's not returned, then just be gracious and move on. Kind of shake the feet from your dust. But it's kind of the idea is like, it's not, it's not ready. It's not, a, it's not a place that's gonna be open to you sharing the good news of Jesus. Now, I don't think we're all going to be going off to houses and knocking, saying, can I stay with you? And then they're like, sure. You're like, ah, you've returned to peace. I shall come and live with you and talk talk about Jesus. The principle is this, because we're not all wandering disciples and evangelists, right? The, The principle is this. When you find yourself talking to your son, your daughter, your parent, your friend, your work colleague, your neighbor... And you're having a conversation and, and they say, what did you do last night? And you were like, oh man, I was at the prayer meeting. This is awkward. Um, I went out and then I went home. <laughs> Where did you go? I went to a large building. Was anyone else there? There were other people there. What did you do there? We talked. <laughs> right? And then you find, you find yourself going, well, yeah, I actually went to the prayer meeting or I, I hung out at a youth or, um, you know, I... I went to church on Sunday morning. Oh, you're a Christian. If the response is like, okay, yeah, and they just move on to talk about whatever, maybe they're just disinterested. Maybe they're just kind of shutting you down gently. For some of you, it's a lot more hostile than that. It's like, stop it. Stop talking about this. And it feels awkward and difficult. But maybe the response is, oh, I didn't know you went to church. When you say prayer meeting like, why do people, why would you gather to pray? What, I don't understand. Can you explain to me? Or if you're a young person, it's like, church youth group? Or maybe there's like, young life? Like, what is that? Like, and it's and like, is Jesus, is what? If there's that kind of open door and there's that sense of invitation, I think it's the equivalent of when Jesus says, your peace is returned to you. And it's evidence of the Holy Spirit at work, even very lightly, very small, that I think it's up to us to then say, how do I call this person? How do I get their attention to the spiritual reality of God's love and his transforming power? Not doing it by slapping them in the head like we've done badly over the years as churches, but more just gently like, I'd love to talk to you about that. Is now a good time or do you want to meet up another time? Or People are way more open to spiritual conversations than, than we realize. I was talking to someone right before the service and they said, it's awkward because it feels like sometimes in the places of education that they're open to every other faith than than Christianity. But people are generally open to spiritual conversations. I was a chaplain at university and people are are open to spiritual conversations. It's just framing it and being gentle and being open with your life story, but then also being wise and being like, are they really hostile? Let's not go there but if there's a sense of peace being returned to you. That's why I feel, I was talking to someone else during the service, it's great, I get all these ideas from my sermons when people say, you could have added this to it. There's this, there's, I actually really like this, there's this thought in Jesus, because it's a continuation of ministry. There's this thought with Jesus, that he walked by this person and maybe he kept thinking, oh, I can't wait till the moment Peter and John get to have this moment that he didn't deal with every single person he saw when there was need because there's work for us to do. There's people for us to meet. You see, it's not just Jesus who does the work of calling people to attention, it's us. And we get to participate in that and it is a joy and sometimes it's terrifying, but generally it's a joy. It's like, this is amazing. So that's the first part. It's kind of one of our roles is to try and call people's attention to this big reality. The second one is Jesus followers, we need to direct people's affection to the one, Jesus Christ, who does the work of transformation. Read with me verse 11 and then verse 16. Whilst the man, sorry, while the man held on to Peter and John, this is just after he'd been healed, and he's clinging to these two guys, and he's like, they're like, you're not, we're not letting you go, man. Like, you healed me. And all the people were astonished, and they came running to them, in a place called Solomon's Colonnade. It doesn't matter why it says that. But when Peter saw this, he said to them, 
fellow Israelites. So everyone's run. Everyone's like crowding around Peter and John. And he's like, hey, guys, girls, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us as if by our own power or godliness, we have made this man walk? It's like, why are you looking at us? Verse 16, he gives the answer, by faith in the name of Jesus. This man who you see and know, another hint, this, is, this guy's known, this man who you see and know was made strong. It's Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that's completely healed him as you can see. Now, I'm so tempted to get into the miraculous signs and wonders and healing, and I believe that is for the church today, and I believe that's something we should be praying for. Um, but we're going to get there later because what I think this principle is actually really what this text is about. When we see success in what we do for God, like the healing in this story, like something that we're part of and God seems to grant success, an event goes well, someone gets healed, a church grows, services multiply, you've got great events, numbers are up, you have a great conversation with someone and that it leads them putting their faith in Jesus you preach well and you receive good feedback, or maybe from maybe more of it, it's like you're successful in business. We've made great accomplishments in education. We build something great, or maybe the hardest for some of us, our kids are really successful. And anything we do that directs glory away from God for that amazing thing happening, anything when we take people's affection and we let it rest on ourselves rather than saying, it's, it's really God. And that might seem a little bit like trite. Oh, yeah, I've heard people say that. Thank you for the compliment. It's all Jesus. Anything we do, though, without a genuine heart where we say, no, it really is all Jesus. I mean, honestly, like, the fact that I... Some people would say they get to preach and they love preaching. Some people feel that they have to preach. <laughs> and it's a sense of burden because of the sense of weight and responsibility and shepherding a group of people and being teaching, being faithful to God's word. It's tiring, it's if, if the burden of it. So when people may come and say to me and others who speak, like the, the, the trap and the temptation is something that Peter and John have gone to lengths to, to distance themselves from the affection where others can kind of, you know, can harmlessly offer that to us. But what it does to the all of us, either, you know, not just preachers, but anyone who has success in something, when we start kind of ex taking that on, yeah, thank you, yeah, I, I, I know, I, you know, I worked harder than everyone else, and I, my, my plan really was executed well, and, and yeah, look, everything I've done is because of me. I'm a self-made man or woman. Several places in our text, Peter and John, they keep pointing to Jesus. They're like, do you get it? It's like annoyingly repetitive. It's like, no, it's Jesus. No, it's Jesus. No, it's Jesus. Giving him names and titles. They talk about the resurrection, all pointing to God's, it, everything points to, they even, they even, like, they land this one on them. It's the same Jesus that you all chose a murderer over him. That guy, it's nothing to do with us. Everything they're doing is pointing people's affection away from themselves to Jesus. We recently stayed at a, beautiful cabin over New Year's. Um, and the craftsmanship of this building was genuinely amazing, like truly incredible. Um, and the, in the guest book, I read back and read all the comments. And then there was one that praised the level of quality and it said this, it is a glory to God. You see, as Christians, we want all the glory to go to God all the time. If you lead a team in business, let the culture you create be a glory to God. If you create teaching plans that are effective and are seeing results, let, let that teaching plan and its success be a glory to God in and of itself. If your kids have been successful, we'll revisit this one here briefly. They are a glory to God and their success is a glory to God. It is a gift from him. It is a gift from him. When, when Peter says it's in the name of Jesus, it's like the sense of it being a gift that Jesus has done this in the first place. Who knows the name Eric Little? Eric Little. Hand up. Okay, Eric Little was a British runner, Scottish runner. 
Scottish people aren't known for being fast, so he's, we always, I always love to talk about him because there's other cultures that are faster than Scots, unless there's a sale in the shop. Then we're really fast. <laughs> we're gone, it's time. Eric Little was this uh, amazing runner, Olympic runner, but he was also a Christian. He was thinking of going into the ministry, like to be a pastor. Um, and he, was, he signed up for the Olympics. He went off and he was shocked when all of a sudden he realized that one of the races he was to run, his main race, the 100 meters, the, the, you know, the fastest one, the coolest one. If you've ever seen like the Olympics is always like the pinnacle is like when Hussein Bolt just like kills, like destroys everyone else. It's awesome. 100 meters is like the, the, the cool one. I like that one the best. If you don't like the 100 meters or you don't know what the Olympics are, just smile and wave. <laughs> but the, like Eric Little, well, that was him. He was, he was Hussein Bolt of his day. Is he still the fastest guy? I know he's retired, but has anyone broken his records, Hussein Bolt? Does, I don't think so. I don't think so. So Eric Little was the Hussein Bolt of his day. He went to the Olympics, and would you believe the 100 meters was on the Sabbath? As someone who was deeply spiritual, Eric Little, not just spiritual, but as someone who was committed to... to to honoring God with his time and his life. And he said, the Sabbath is a day that is God's alone and I don't do anything on that day. I don't work. and I'm not going to run on that day. So imagine this like Hussein Bolt from a few years ago before he retired saying, I can't run. It's Sunday. So Eric Little was put in another race and he won that race, although it wasn't his top race. Did he do two more rates? Did he, did he win two golds in that same Olympics? Amazing feat. Whatever, he did at least one amazing feat, right? So he was the guy who was going to set to win. He chose to give it up. And what he said was this. He said, when I, when I run, because people were like, Eric, you're amazing. You, you went into your second race and you still beat. It's just amazing. And he said this. He said, I can't accept the praise. He said, he said this. He said, when I run, I feel God's pleasure as if God has given him a gift. It's a gift that God's made him that way. To, and he said, God made me fast. Like Scots people running for a sale. God made us fast on certain occasions. But it's a gift. And whenever we have success of any kind, I think so often we can be like, yeah, it's just something that happened. I happen to be good at this. Like the person who created this made this cabin. I just happen to have these skills. I personally think... It's something that God gifts us with, this ability. Now there's training and development, all that stuff, but at the heart of it, there's just a gift that God gives us. So when we see success, and I'll bring it back to the story for Peter and John, there was this temptation to take the affirmation, attention, and the affection of people because it's all coming at them. They're like, wow, you guys healed this dude. This is amazing. And it would have been so easy to go... Yeah, like we spent like three years with Jesus, like we're like this, like we're like key people and his people, yeah. It would have been so easy. It would have been so easy. And instead he's like, it's Jesus, it's a gift. Anything we do is because he's gifted it to us. Howard Marshall says again, one can be impressed with the spectacular without responding to what it signifies, which is the power and the grace of God. The power and the grace of God. People are always going to be impressed with the spectacular. As Christians, we have this amazing opportunity to be countercultural. We have a friend who is a brand manager of some pretty well known people. Um, but we're all brand managers if you're on social media. Right? It's kind of what we're meant to do is we're meant to kind of manage our brand. We're meant to manage, put images up, put words up that kind of capture who we are and give a sense of all the great things we can do. And here's the thing, I don't wanna say don't use social media, I wanna say use it for the glory of God. If you see an amazing sunset in the morning, or sorry, sunrise over this side, sunset over this way, I know my east and west. If you see something, take a picture and go, don't be like, you know, blessed to have a morning, like to, don't make it about you. Take a moment and make it about God. If you're, if you're involved with something and you've got a ton of success and there's more people came or, or your business has done better or at your, the class that no one else wanted to teach, you've mastered how to teach them and they're like, they're doing great. You could find a way of celebrating that that is a gift from God and we wanna give God the glory for it. You see, when we do that as a people, it's so countercultural, like it was for Peter and John, 
that when they gave them the opportunity and further down this, like more people come to faith because they're like, it's so countercultural. No, guys, you're getting it wrong. It's not us. It's Jesus. And I think when we point away from ourselves and take people's affection, notice they have affection. They want to give worship and glory. They want that sense of connection. And you're like, no, it's not me. It's, it's God. It's him. When we do that, it's so countercultural that people, we, start making a dent and a difference in a culture that is so obsessed with self. And it allows us not just to say, look at me as a good example, but we can actually say, look at God who gifts us these amazing things. Uh, I'm gonna invite the band up to play and we're gonna pray, but then we're gonna sing. Sometimes when you plan a service, you're like, can you, it, it kind of fits together because there's a lot of thought that goes into it. Then sometimes like, like this, um, there's a song that was chosen a while back and, and the, the, the verse or the chorus, which one of the two says, it's your breath in my lungs. So I, so I pour out my praise to you. It's kind of what, what we've been designed for. Every good gift that comes from God is for our benefit. And then we pour out our praise to him. So if God, is, if God has got you on a track right now of success and you're being blessed, like it's, it's, as, it's as much as the breath that he gave you in your lungs. And I want to encourage us all, pour out your praise. Call people and their attempt, call people's attention to the reality, but then don't hold, don't hold it to yourself give it back to God and say it's him. Because when we do that, people will be transformed. Why don't we stand together and we're gonna worship. Let's just pray quickly before we start. Jesus, you're just so radically different. And we believe that Peter and John are just doing exactly what you would have done, what you did. And it fills me with so much hope thinking, these normal, these normal guys just did what Jesus would do, followed in his footsteps, were obedient to the prompting of the Holy Spirit, and look what happened. People's affection for, for greater, people's affection was like lit up. And then Peter and John humbly, rightly, just saying, it's all, it's all Jesus. Jesus, we want to be a people who call people's attention, but then direct it to you. As we're all thinking of someone in our minds who we would long to see that happen for, Holy Spirit, we pray, would you be at work? Would you give us eyes to see and ears to hear the right time, the right moment, the right way to have a conversation? And we pray, God, that you would be working in their hearts to give them a sense of openness and that we would see our peace being returned. Holy Spirit, fill us afresh.